Susie, that's a great question. What am I sitting on? Um, well, aside from the obvious, um, the uh, object below me um, is the same object that's pictured in the cross-eyed stereogram to the uh, right of the stage. And it is a porphyrin, N, or a, let's see, it's a ruthenium porphyrin compound. It's got an NO on one side of the porphyrin, and it's got a, oh, it's a tetrachlorophenol on the other side. Uh, this was a um, molecule made and crystal structure determined by uh, Dennis Awazabiza, who uh, works uh, for my collaborator, uh, George Richteradu. Actually, Dennis uh, started a faculty position on uh, the East Coast uh, a couple of years ago, and I think he's doing very well. So, uh, let's see, my clock says uh, 10.02 uh, Pacific Standard Time. Uh, so, I think I will start. Um, glad to be here. Um, for those of you in the United States and perhaps elsewhere, remember that uh, Spring Forward happens tonight. Uh, so, if you're going to brunch, uh, make sure that you're not late tomorrow. Um, there is disorder in the structure, yes. Uh, there's actually some um, disorder in the um, where the solvent is, a little hex, hexane there. So, um, welcome, welcome today. Uh, today I'm going to tell you a little bit, uh, show you a little bit of the behind the scenes stuff uh, in uh, the research I do. As I was putting this talk together, I realized just how much stuff there is. Uh, so um, I'm, I'm going to be selective in what I focus on, and maybe um, there are techniques and stuff that uh, we can talk about in uh, future uh, lectures. Uh, behold, these are two of my three cats, uh, Ishtar and Marduk. Marduk is called Mardi now. Uh, Ishtar is on the left. Uh, I, there is another cat. You'll see him later, Seth. We've all got ancient uh, deity names for um, cats now. Um, let's see. I have to figure out how to change the slides. I think I type backslash one in. Um, I'm also going to show you all sorts of pictures. Uh, here's one from the Smithsonian in 1997. That's not my lab, um, but that would be a state-of-the-art uh, chemistry lab in the year 1900. And you know, in our program, the class Quantitative Analysis teaches you how to function in that um, environment. And it's still a very relevant class that uh, we teach today. And kind of the stuff that we do as chemists have evolved from um, the simple techniques that uh, those guys, well, not particularly those guys, but because uh, they're mannequins. Um, but, um, you know, fellows like that would have. So here's an abstract. If you read that, you'll have the same expression as Sin. Uh, Sin passed away a couple of years ago. He was actually a beautiful cat, as you can see. Um, we rescued him from the campus. Our campus is uh, 2,660 acres of land. It's the largest contiguous campus in uh, the United States. And there's a population of feral cats. And we found. Uh, three adorable little kittens, and uh, I, I brought one home, uh, like 2007. So I'm going to be telling you about what we do. Backslash one n. Uh, let's get some acknowledgments um, in first, so I uh, can properly thank people. Um, so. I'm the guy on the right, my buddy George, George Richteradu, Dr. Richteradu at the University of Oklahoma. He and I have been collaborating for 22 years. We met in grad school in 1988. Um, his was the first PhD oral defense that I went to. I started grad school in 1988. Uh, in September and October, I went to his thesis defense, I'm sorry, his PhD dissertation defense, and I was scared shitless. Oh my God, excuse the language. Um, it was a 20-minute talk followed by an hour and a half of uh, questions from the campus committee, the, uh, someone from engineering, and an external examiner flown in from the East Coast. Um, George did very, very well, and uh, he 
over the next few years of my PhD was a uh, you know source of inspiration and uh, mentorship. We have been collaborating for a hell of a long time now. Um, and in fact, we decided about 12 years ago that, hey, we should be funded for some of these activities that we're doing. And uh, so we've started writing grants together. We are now on our fourth one. It's the NSF um, CHE 19-00181. Uh, now, he and I have been uh, sending students to each other's labs um, since really 2001, and it ramped up in the past uh, decade. So there's some pictures there. Um, um, top one is of George's lab. Second one down is of uh, me and George. Uh, there's Dennis uh, of the crystal structure I happen to be sitting on. That's uh, what I'm sitting on is the molecular surface of the molecules shown in the stereogram to the um, left of uh, uh, Dennis got. And uh, let's see, there's uh, Adam and Kenny. Um, Jim, we will use real name to protect the innocent. Um, and uh, those guys are uh, both at University of Oklahoma and uh, in my lab, especially Adam. Uh, uh, got his master's with me, got a PhD with Okay, moving on. There we go. So uh, let's talk a little bit about the uh, purpose of our uh, research. We're looking at uh, metal mediated transformations of uh, nitrogen and oxygen. And I've just got a thing called a frost diagram up here. And it just shows some of the various uh, combinations of stable compounds of nitrogen and oxygen. It actually just shows them as uh, functions of uh, pH. Um, all the nitrogen atoms in you pretty much came from the atmosphere at some point or another. And they either have to be fixed by um, a bacteria in the soil, or they come from lightning. Uh, lightning can cause nitrogen and oxygen to combine into uh, nitrogen oxides of various forms. Um, so we are, um, we, we do have to have in living systems ways of taking reduced nitrogen, like NH4 or NH2, ammonia stuff that the bacteria produce, and also the oxidized oxygen, or nitrogen oxide, nitrate, nitrite, nitric acid, acid rain from lightning and other sources. It's important to be able to um, uh, de-nitrify, take those oxygens off. And when you look at what's in you, um, you know, in your DNA, you've got pyrimidines and purines. That's just the name of two compounds, really. Uh, but these are the A's and C's and um, A, C, T, G, I think it is, um, that uh, make up your DNA. Those are um, compounds with um, oxygen not attached to nitrogen. So, you know, we have to be able to uh, make these things um, have to be able to make these things do what we want biologically. All right, so a couple more slides here. To emphasize this point. Uh, so all of these steps are known to be mediated biochemically by a thing called a reductase enzyme. And by, the, the naming of enzymes is wonderful because you uh, Take, a, take, take something that's like a verb, reduction, and uh, turn it into an enzyme name by adding like A-S-E at the end. So a reductase does reduction, and oxygenase does oxidation. Um, a catalase will catalyze something. Um, <laughs> transcriptase will transcript something, right? So, but um, all of these enzymes can be in, or all of these forms of nitrogen, I should use my pointer. Um, all of these forms of nitrogen can be uh, interconverted by various enzymes. And transmutase will transmute things. Although, you know, I've always wondered about that because it would be nice to use transmutase to turn lead into gold, but it's not that kind of transmuting. Let's see. OK, so our current focus is um, NO to NO2. Oh, I'm sorry, NO to N2O. N2O is nitrous oxide. That's laughing gas, essentially. 
And oh, if you breathe it in, you won't be laughing, you'll be choking. Let's call it choking gas. Uh, NO is um, very, very rough on you. It, uh, is, um, it, it reacts with oxygen to form um, NO2, which is a component of uh, smog. You'll be coughing if you're breathing um, NO. There's all sorts of other things that NO does as well that I'll touch on in, uh, later in the talk. So why N2O? Why nitrous oxide? That's a greenhouse gas, and it is emitted in high quantities. So here's some um, information that is still on the um, um, US um, uh, EPA's uh, websites. Um, it's gas emissions in 2017. Uh, um, of United States is gas emissions, um, greenhouse gas emissions, uh, carbon dioxide made 82%. Methane was the next highest uh, one, and it's probably underestimated there. Nitrous oxide, N2O, was 6% uh, of the total. But N2O is uh, 300 times as powerful as carbon dioxide in being a uh, greenhouse gas. So even the 6% is uh, troubling. I got to say most of this is from biological sources. Uh, fungi will take uh, NO that's attached to iron. Bacteria will take um, um, a more reduced form of NO. Like, OK, when I say reduced, I should, mean, should be saying a form that has more electrons word oxidation and reduction to a chemist. They roll off the tongue so easily, but I got to remember that um, I'm talking to non-specialists. So a quick, a quick note on my language. The um, iron-3 form is called oxidized because it's got less electrons. Iron-2 form is called reduced because it's got more electrons. The origin of the words comes uh, from a couple of centuries ago. Um, oxidation used to mean it had more oxygen in it. But we've since co-opted the term to um, talk about the more fundamental thing about the electron uh, count. Okay, uh, Reduction used to be, hey, we had more hydrogen in it. Um, and again, we've reduced it to, ah, there we go. We've um, um, changed the meaning of the word to be more fundamental. Yes, indeed. Uh, so the sorts of compounds we look at are guided by biological systems. Here's an example up in the upper left over here. I think you can see my uh, pointer. My pointer um, seems to be a uh, side on. It always happens when I rotate the screen, but I think you can see it. In the upper, um, upper right-hand corner, um, we see an um, enzyme called bacterial NO reductase. Um, so it takes NO and it turns it into um, N2O. It's a membrane spanning enzyme, and you can see all these little corkscrew things that uh, live inside the membrane um, of a uh, cell component. There's a little bit on the um, outside. Deep inside the membrane part, we have a heme, a heme molecule. A heme molecule is a porphyrin. Okay, a porphyrin is basically this ring structure you see here. That's the general name for it. The blue is nitrogen. They form a square. And in the center of the square is a iron atom. Essentially, with uh, this bacterial NO uh, reductase, there is another iron atom. And they basically grab an NO between them, and they activate it, and they make um, things happen. Uh, they, basically, um, they basically make it possible for two NOs to come together and turn into N2O and water. Uh, let's see, I've got a couple of other enzymes around. Um, above the screen, directly above the screen in blue, and you can come in and take a look at it if you want, is a, a human nitric oxide synthase. Um, from that human nitric oxide synthase, I've actually got a um, electrostatic surface, like what the charges are on the surface of the molecule. 
as this kind of Millennium Falcon looking thing that's just above the screen and over to the right. I'll just move it in here. And it, so it's, it's, it's this thing. I always think of it as looking like the Millennium Falcon. Um, that's a heme. And blue represents areas of positive charge. Red represents areas of negative charge. On the bottom, you can see a big red spot right in the middle. That um, is uh, the oxygen on a um, NO that's bound to the iron. If you look at it from the top, you see kind of a blue area right in the middle. So um, yeah, this, uh, this uh, came from the um, RCSB uh, protein database. I was able to export that. Um, the heme I'm showing you here actually comes from the big blue molecule. The big blue molecule is not to scale, though, because uh, if the big blue molecule were the to, to be the scale of the Millennium Falcon looking thing, it would actually be the size of the entire island, uh, our entire region that we're on. That, that would kind of spoil the look of our region. So these uh, molecules with metals in them that move electrons around to make NO do things are really important for uh, biology. Uh, let me remind you about NO in you. NO is a neurotransmitter. It's uh, involved in the transmission of pain signals. It's also secreted by your white blood cells as a like bleach, you know, to kill bacteria. Uh, it's also a signaling molecule. It relaxes the um, smooth muscle tissue around your arteries so that your blood pressure can go down. Uh, hopefully, hopefully you don't need to uh, release too much of it while I'm talking to you. So yes, vasodilation. So we have we have uh, all sorts of different. Uh, uses for NO in us, it only lasts seven, sec seven seconds. It's got a seven second half life under ph physiological conditions before it turns into something else. Um, Viagra, yes, indeed, it works because uh, it is an NO reuptake inhibitor. So it basically uh, jams the mechanisms that uh, get rid of the NO, so the NO can continue to signal. The signal is therefore amplified. Um, NO is yeah pretty toxic because it lasts because uh, because uh, it's very reactive essentially. It's a radical molecule, uh, but it's nice that it is so reactive and uh, gets uh, cleared away so quickly so that it can be released on demand, right? Uh, chlorines and porphyrins are related, yes, uh, and you really don't want to have too much NO around in you. Um, nitrous, eh, I don't really want nitrous around in me either. All righty, so here's another, uh, this one's an oxygenase uh, enzyme. Let me get rid of that. There we go. This is an oxygenase uh, enzyme, but you can use NO to jam it up and get a crystal of it stable enough for you to characterize. Um, you can see it's another heme right here. There's the N, there's the O um, up, up above. There's a little pocket and a channel for the gas to diffuse in and out. Um, make a direct link. Look. Oh, how interesting. A uh, direct link um, to the site that where you can look at this and move it around. Really? So I am trying to copy, copy hyperlink, and then paste the hyperlink. And things aren't cooperating with me. OK, sad face. Um, you can uh, go to the uh, SC website where we posted the uh, PowerPoint and uh, click on that link. It should be it should be able to bring that up. Okay, so I kind of talked about uh, me and George and our uh, collaborations. Uh, there's a partition of work. Uh, the PhD students at the University of Oklahoma primarily uh, do the uh, synthesis. Um, that first one in. Um, 
spend um, or they uh, study the actual biological heme uh, in enzymes such as uh, hemoglobin and myoglobin. They've got a variety of uh, ones they use. Um, they uh, used to partner with a uh, veterinarian to be able to isolate the hemoglobin and myoglobin from um, uh, blood samples from uh, cats. Uh, they've also got a um, nice big uh, supply, um, um, legacy supply from uh, sperm whale myoglobin. So um, that's where a lot of their um, structural work has uh, come from in biological uh, samples. The inorganic models you can just make. Now I'm going to show you how to make uh, some of these things. My students have been looking at the, the non-heme, the non-biological ones. Um, it's a pain to make these porphyrins, uh, especially for an undergraduate. My experience has been that um, by the time you spent two semesters with an undergrad in the lab doing hands-on, and by the time they can make the porphyrins uh, themselves and make the starting materials for the interesting reactions, they have to graduate. And, and that makes us sad. Um, in, in, if you're lucky, if you're lucky, if I'm lucky, um, they'll stay for masters and are all set to be very productive. But most often, they um, either go to work in local industry, and um, I'm in, near St. Louis in the United States, um, a lot of uh, biotech type industry, um, or they go off for a PhD. Okay. Both of us, both the groups, are looking at both ruthenium and iron. Why would that be? Let's see. Okay, I got a slide on that somewhere. Um, let me tell you about what we do in a nutshell, though. Um, our approach uh, in, in my lab is uh, we prepare specific target compounds. And some of these are air and moisture sensitive. So, you know, if you just leave them out on the bench in a jar or something like that, they'll sadly decompose. Uh, stuff we're working on right now is not so dramatic as just to catch fire on exposure to air. I do have some stuff like that, but uh, not, not really stuff that we work with uh, uh, day to day. Once we made something, we have to figure out is it what we have made? Because you know, if you just say, "Hey, I made this," people won't believe you. You have to show them spectra and things like that. So we use uh, spectroscopic uh, methods. I'll talk about that in a second. X-ray diffraction methods. The uh, structures I told you. To, uh, I love X-ray diffraction methods because I can take the data and uh, turn it into a mesh model and upload it into Second Life to show you as that's that's a really powerful thing about X-ray X-ray data. Um, but we've got other uh, spectroscopic techniques that are a little easier for us to actually use, but harder for us to interpret. And finally, we investigate these. I do electrochemistry. I've spent uh, the last 32 years learning electrochemistry, a thing called spectroelectrochemistry, to figure out the consequences of electron transfer. Ooh, osmium tetroxide sounds scary to me because um, it's that's fairly toxic. Um, hopefully you are. Hope, hopefully you're safe. Yay! So yeah, we have actually George's group has done stuff uh, with osmium. The chemistry is very similar to uh, the ruthenium, uh, so we've kind of uh, laid off the um, osmium work a little. Um, Hey, this is from my hot water heater in my uh, basement, uh, but it's kind of like what people think my lab is like. Um, it serves a purpose here. We have to teach and promote a culture of uh, safety. There's a lot of bad things that can happen in a lab, and especially, you know, little things like, oh, you've left the um, solvent jar open and the lab is filled up with flammable vapors, and then you turned on a stirring motor and it made a spark. Uh, you know, we have to kind of think about consciousness of all of these. Fortunately, the lab is engineered by very good airflow, and we don't get build up. But, you know, there are hazardous materials we work with. There are procedures that can be done to minimize This is why when I work with a student, I don't work with too many at once. Um, at the beginning, um, 
me and my student trying to figure out how to make this stuff because both of us hands solve one problem. Um, yeah, that hood is not drawing nearly fast enough. Okay. So here's some pictures of synthesis. Uh, one of these pictures is not like the other. Um, I, starting at, on, on, on the left, here's, um, here's uh, one of us. Uh, some of the actual compounds we're working with, we use vacuum lines. These hoses can be put under argon, uh, so we can have argon blowing out of our uh, glass vessels, or they can be uh, put under vacuum so we can uh, evaporate off uh, solvents or make filtration happen or the like. Um, oh, this is, this is um, tetrabutylmonium hexafluorophosphate. If you say that backwards, you have to worry because the demons show up. But um, that's one of the compounds we use for our characterization. We have to purify things. Um, this is another compound. This is actually from a, a lab. Uh, this is one that's related to the thing we wrap around our metals. Um, and what am I doing to that poor turkey on the right? Yeah, um, I showed up at the party um, and uh, deep fried a turkey in one of my colleagues' um, driveways. Uh, this, this is actually about 10 years ago. Um, I should be wearing safety glasses doing this. Um, I, I will admit that. Uh, but but uh, the turkey was uh, delicious, and it was a student party, and Oh my God, it lasted about five minutes or so because all the graduate students came and consumed it. It was like watching a pack of wolves. Um, so so that's, that's kind of a fun thing. And honestly, the skills you learn in a lab uh, of, of being careful help you do things like this so that you can't, uh, you know, like, you know, burning, burning your junior colleagues' houses down is frowned upon. Um, this last picture is uh, distillation. Um, we're basically taking a solvent. It's blue because there's a drying agent in there. We have to have exquisitely dry um, solvents. Dry as in uh, it will react with water. I've actually got literally sodium in there and a compound called benzophenone that reacts with the sodium and then reacts with water to uh, get rid of it all. And it distills over to that side. So, oh yeah, no, we don't deep fry any turkeys in, in my house. So, here's an experimental setup. We're making NO. Uh, we've got all sorts of hoses. One hose lets uh, argon in. Um, we've got uh, sodium nitrite. And, and this is probably what's uh, making uh, or curing um, uh, bacon, in fact, in So a lot of the times we're doing stuff in a dry box. Uh, this thing here is a dry box. It looks like Alvin the submarine. Um, I've got a better picture of this same dry box after we moved into a new building. So I'll talk to you more about it there. Uh, the atmosphere inside the dry box is pure argon. And it's got a dew point of minus 40 degrees. Basically, you'd have to cool something to minus 40 degrees Celsius to actually start condensing any frost on it. Um, Inside the dry box, we can work. The gloves let us do uh, things like scraping out compounds. Uh, this is an iron compound that uh, we were making in the early 2000s. Uh, seemed like a good example to show you. OK. Um, let's see. One of our main tools is uh, this. It's a double manifold vacuum line, and we're using shrink tubes. Um, this probably sounds pretty arcane to you. Uh, let me, this one is actually from George's lab. Here's George lurking around while I'm taking this photograph. Um, so if you see where my pointer is, that's a rubber tube. It leads to a vacuum pump. There's a big old vacuum pump in the cabinet below this. There's a tube in the back. That's under vacuum. There's a tube in the front. It is connected to an argon tank. And there are valves. One, two, three, four valves, each with a hose underneath. 
These valves can allow you to select to put the hose under vacuum or to put the hose under argon. With this tool, we can, um, we can uh, control pressure and control atmosphere. And in our Schlenk tubes, oh man, a Schlenk tube is a test tube that's uh, got a valve on the side. I, uh, adding the valve to the side uh, only like makes it a hundred times more expensive, but um, it allows us to uh, do a lot of fine work to make compounds that you couldn't if you were just slopping stuff around in air. Oh, Sizzy, that's that's adorable. Um, all the unwanted reactions are gone. I'm using it and I'm appropriating it. Mine now. All righty. Uh, that's my old lab. Uh, when I got to um, school I'm at, um, you know, we were um, um, in the process of designing a new building for us. That's the old lab. I had most of my vacuum lines out in that middle bench. Um, that's giving me a shivers down my spine. Uh, that's my new lab. Uh, it's actually the first time I, or one of the first times I was allowed in the new lab. I had moved a few things over. Uh, the dry box is actually sitting in this spot right now. I'll show you that uh, a bit later. Um, yeah, we hadn't done any um, anything bad to it yet, although it was still so new that the um, builders hadn't gone through the punch list yet. Uh, and there are a couple of things leaking here and there. I actually walked in one day and uh, there was water coming out of the electrical outlets, like, you know, where you plug things in, those little holes, uh, there's water oozing out of there one day. And I'm like, oh, can we fix that? That seems awfully dangerous. Yeah, that was fixed the same. I think it was the lowest bidder. Um, so those are the uh, vac lines and the fume hoods uh, when I was just setting them up. You can see it's the same sort of setup. I've got hoses that go to a vacuum pump. They even say vacuum pump, big red letters. So you And then um, the um, glass tubing with the uh, valves. Um, my hoses are down here because I was still working on setting, setting them up. Let's see. That's, yeah. So my students and I just love this new space. Uh, it actually means that we have um, about double or more the space. Because uh, let's see, if I go back to, let's see, slash one, two. Can I do that? OK, that's. Taking time. There we go. It took time for me to, to res for me. So back here behind that wall, see that window? That's a, a space for the graduate students. So there's a separate office for the graduate students to be able to eat because you should not bring food into the lab, especially if it's nitric oxide stuff going on and all the poisonous stuff we do. Um, they can actually look at the lab and like see if someone's on fire or something like that and either choose to call for help or just kind of ghost away. Um, they they don't. If someone's if, if someone is uh, needing help in the lab, they uh, rush in and, and help. Never happened in my lab that someone's um, had that kind of emergency. But just being able to see from your office what's going on in the lab is wonderful. It kind of means that you don't have to enter the lab in, if you hear something going. Okay, so going back there. No advance. Hey, here's some pictures from campus. Um, so our new building, uh, circa I don't know, 2013. That's when I took that picture. Uh, it's oh, it's lovely. I took that photo on uh, real film actually, uh, and it's basically our campus from above. Uh, one of the flights to St. Louis from Washington actually uh, goes directly over the campus. These deer are outside uh, the science building. There are two little baby deer. Uh, that was this summer. Uh, last spring, the uh, cherry trees were in bloom. It's amazing. And uh, this is what we have in the fall, all of these lovely um, 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 maple trees changing. 
dollar. Oh yeah, it's twenty six hundred acres of land. We only use a like I don't know twenty acres in the middle. The rest is forest. There are coyote. Um, I have seen the coyote. Uh, I have actually seen baby deer parts that have been a coyote's meal. Um, and, oh, and yes, there are lots of bike paths on uh, campus uh, as well. It's good to cycle through. Maybe it don't get you. Um, oh yeah, oh man. So I used to cycle home at night. Um, we have lots of animals. We I cycled home at night, um, and I, I could see all these little sparkly things as I'm cycling. And it turns out that it was some weird migration of thousands of spiders, and I could just see their eyes. It was the most freaky thing I'd ever seen. Let's see. So um, what we do, we make things. Then we have to prove that the stuff we have is what we say we have, right? Um, I have the same conversation with every student. The students tell me, well, I followed the instructions and I got something the right color. And it's like, okay, um, are your eyes spectrometers? No. How do you know it's the right stuff? Well, I followed the directions and it's the right color. Okay, what color is it supposed to be? Green. But grass is green. Have you made grass? No, I followed it. Okay, so then you get the idea. Then then I say, well, let's let's be scientific about it and get get some actual data. Um, I'm actually going to uh, tell you a little bit of details about um, uh, magnetic resonance spectroscopy um, and uh, gloss over some of the others uh, in the interest of time. Right. I actually showed you some x-ray stuff. We got. I can bring x-ray stuff into Second Life. It is the most wonderful thing. Um, uh, and for us, using ruthenium helps us with our characterization. Um, iron, for for reasons, um, tends to have unpaired electrons. Most of the time in a molecule, um, the electrons pair up so that one spinning in one direction, another spinning in the opposite direction, are kind of at the same energy level and occupy the same space. It's called an orbital. And their magnetic fields cancel out. Eh, iron, for reasons, uh, doesn't always do that. So the unpaired electrons make huge local magnetic fields that uh, make it more difficult to interpret the magnetic resonance uh, signals. So, and But ruthenium is like iron's well-behaved big brother. And it doesn't do the unpaired electron thing nearly as much. So. Um, you know, with the resources at hand, we can uh, get spectra that tell us we have what we're supposed to have. All righty. Ah, okay. Let me tell you about uh, Fourier transforms. Okay, so today, little mini lecture on NMR. And here are my three take home messages. Okay. Um, yeah, it's the same phenomenon that gives us magnetic resonance imaging. I'm not going to talk about actual imaging today. I'm just going to talk about the radio signals we get out of um, molecular samples. It's the uh, same physics, but not the same uh, instrument. Okay. Three take home messages. You're going to get a graph. And where the peaks show up on the x axis tells you about the electronics of, this, of the thing that gave you the peak. Right, which is usually the nucleus of an atom. That tells you about environment. That's a huge bit of information. Okay. The second thing, you got peaks. They have areas under them. If you integrate, basically can find what those areas are. Well, those areas are in the same ratio as the types of nuclei in your sample are. So let's say that you've got a molecule and it's got a CH2 attached to a CH3, right? That's called an ethyl group. Well, you have a signal that has an area that if you define it as two, there will be a signal somewhere else whose area should be pretty close to three, right? This lets us start to figure out um, like different types of uh, structural features. And finally, 
neighboring nuclei talk to each other. And so signals aren't just like single peaks, they get split into um, predictable patterns. And you can use the predictable patterns to say what the neighbors are doing. These, um, the, this is a very powerful um, set of methods, these NMR methods. Um, in fact, uh, to be an accredited uh, department of chemistry, accredited by the um, American Chemical Society, the department must have um, a, mag a nuclear magnetic resonance spectrometer. Let's see. So, backslash one, in. yay. Okay, so um, FTNMR, I always talk about bells. Um, I actually teach the uh, NMR class, uh, the practical NMR class at uh, SIUE. Uh, so um, there are a lot of different nuclei, a lot of different isotopes, I should say, that are appropriate for NMR. You essentially have to have an isotope where the nucleus has angular momentum, where it's spinning, essentially. Um, and the best ones are the ones that can take up two spin states, like like spinning, oh, this is terribly wrong, and it's. I'm glad that no one is close to me because I'd be slapped, but if I said, oh, spinning clockwise and counterclockwise, that would give you, that'd be a great metaphor, but terrible physics, right? Because it's a quantum particle and you can't, you know, it, anyway, it's got angular momentum and you can think of two spin states. If you want to think of them as clockwise and counterclockwise, um, no one's going to uh, come up and uh, slap you, okay? So here's the thing. Um, we can put these samples in a magnetic field. What happens in a magnetic field if you are a spinning charged particle? Well, a spinning charged particle is a little magnet. generates a magnetic field. If you put this particle inside a bigger magnetic field, then um, you'll be able to align it with the field or against the field. That's two different energies, and uh, that means the system is set up so that it can absorb energy to flip the spin. Overall, a whole sample is going to have a lot of different nuclei in it. And you can think of it like a bell. You can basically think of it as you can strike the bell, and then with a bell, you'll get sound waves out. Right? Here's your bell. Here's sound waves. And this thing, this image, is actually sound waves coming out of a bell. In uh, NMR, you hit the sample with radio frequency. In, in our spectrometer, this is actual data, in our spectrometer, you hit it with 400 megahertz NMR, uh, radiation. That's 400 on your FM dial. Um, 400 on your FM dial, and you get a short radio wave phosphorescence, I guess. As you um, hit it with the radiation, you turn the radiation off, and you listen to the radio signals coming out. They're very, very, very weak. They undergo exponential decay, and they're just a bunch of sine waves. Right? Well, if you had an FM radio that went to 400, it would go. But let me tell you this. Um, on our um, spectrometer, uh, the magnetic field is such that protons come at 400. Carbon, carbon-13, right, uh, a naturally occurring isotope, actually comes at 100. So we can take a radio into our NMR lab, turn it on, tune it to 100, and we can listen to it pulsing away when we're doing a uh, carbon. Sounds like a um, uh, sonar on a... Um, on a, um, a submarine. Okay, so that's the raw data. And I look at this raw data and say, I can't tell anything about that. And essentially, this data is telling us intensity versus time. Well, I want, I want peaks. And I, I, I would like to know what frequencies the signals are at. Frequency is one over time, right? So essentially, what we want to do is do some math on this and take intensity versus time and turn the intensity um, intensity uh, versus one over time. And that's what a Fourier transform will do. And I came across this wonderful demo. Um, let's see. 
across this wonderful demo. Can I copy, copy, and can I paste? Yes. All right. Uh, this was recently featured in Journal of uh, Chemical Education, and they have a Python program that does this, and they hosted their Python program on the pythonanywhere.com site. Um, so essentially, if I go through their graphic real fast, um, it's a teaching tool. Here is the data you'd get from a spectrometer if there were only one signal. It's, it's basically a sine wave that decays exponentially. And the next thing you do is superimpose on it maybe a some other sine wave. And you do a point by point multiplication to get the uh, third graph here. And um, essentially what will happen is say your peak on the pink and the peak on the blue line up positive and positive number multiplied will give you a positive number. Well, if the frequencies are the same, then maybe your peak or uh, the trough will line up and the negative number times a negative number also gives you a positive number, right? So when the uh, signals line up, you'll get more positive numbers on this graph, the number three, than negative numbers. When they don't line up, eh, they'll probably just average out to zero. But essentially what they do uh, in this third one, they add up all the positive integrations, they add up all the negative integrations, um, and add up those two. And then there's a point, one point on the graph. Okay, well, that's one point. It's not like every single frequency. But if you repeat this process, for every single frequency, then the um, then you can build up a spectrum on uh, in the fourth graph. Okay, so I, I do that, did that uh, for you, and um, basically, um, you know, when they uh, test the right frequency, they get an actual peak. Okay, notice how. Um, they started with a longer frequency, and now these uh, pink lines are really close together, and that's showing that it's a uh, it's a much uh, higher frequency. All right, uh, we can repeat this. This is a lovely site to go to, the Python Anywhere um, site, because uh, it, it shows it actually shows you um, this as an animation. Um, here, it's this whole same process. Um, there's three signals superimposed. That gives you the dark blue line when you add them all up, and it's it's you know not as uh, pretty as uh, the original signal we had in the last set. Then, uh, if it goes through the same process of test frequencies, integration, and then um, uh, plotting the overall plot, you see um, more signals. Okay, so I'm sure there are much better algorithmic ways that our instruments actually do uh, for a transform with, but this is a nice way of explaining it to students. Um, let's see, backslash one. So I showed you a, uh, I showed you some of our um, experimental data. Oh, not quite yet, but. Next. Okay, so the fast Fourier transform NM, NMR, um, there's, uh, there's the links, and uh, there's a reminder of the take home messages. Um, the electronic environment is where the peaks are on the x axis. Integration gives you the relative number of nuclei, and um, the splitting patterns will give you. Um, like what NMR active nuclei are nearby. So uh, getting to the actual transform data, it looks like that. And to me, this is a thing of beauty. So here's the um, free induction decay. That's what you call the raw data. And this other spectrum is the transformed data. And I've got a 
crystal structure that's close to our molecule, uh, this thing should be a benzene. What's pictured is a cyclohexane with some disorder, but if it were a benzene, then it would be the exact molecule I'm showing you. It's, this is a structure that my group um, did. Uh, the compound had been published before its structure was. Uh, this was a redetermination. And uh, what we can look at is, uh, this is a hydrogen NMR. So all of these little white dots are showing up as peaks. So the one that I've got my uh, pointer on is this guy and th this guy. There's a mirror plane, so this guy and this guy, the CH double bond N, end up being equivalent. My students look at that peak. If there's only one peak in that region, say from here, hello, from here to here, okay, from here to here. If there's only one uh, peak in that little region, my guys have made a pure compound. Uh, if there's two peaks in there, then you know I have to tell them, okay, well, there's something else in there. Figure out what it is. Verify it. We can actually um, we can actually assign what all of the signals are on uh, this graph. Um, all of them except for that guy right there. There's just the tiniest little thing. I don't know what it is, um, but it didn't show up. Uh, it didn't show up again after we put the sample under vacuum for a while. So I think there's some solvent that went away. To me, it's a thing of beauty because it's showing just how pure this sample is and that it's high enough quality for us to do um, uh, to do uh, proper work. Uh, proper work with. Yeah, a student. I was very proud of uh, proud of the student. Uh, he, he should be graduating uh, this semester. He's writing his thesis up right now. So yeah, basically we understand this spectrum. Okay, this guy here, this guy here, they're the same. This guy here, all the nine hydrogens in that region and all the nine hydrogen in those regions, they're the same. And uh, they correspond to that peak. It's just a little fatter than this peak is. But the area under the peak, if you zoom in, you can see it's 18.0 and 18.1, with this guy being defined, calibrated uh, to be 2. So our areas match. You can see some fine structure down here. I haven't zoomed in on it. but. Uh, the fine structure matches. Um, some of these hydrogens are talking to each other, like these guys and these guys would talk to each other and there would be splitting. Okay, okay I'm in danger of waxing elegant or eloquent about, about these. Um, suffice to say that we can use this method to figure out if our sample is pure or not. Well, I've got a lot that I want to tell you too. <laughs> Uh, so uh, correlation charts, I was teaching a class on this while a um, colleague of mine was um, at a conference and he asked me to teach the NMR part this week. So the thing I told my students is that you have to remember the word correlation chart uh, because if you want to Google and find the correlation chart to figure out where your peaks are, um, then you know, knowing the words is half the battle. Um, couple words for you, and for the hydrogen and for carbon, um, there's a rule of thumb. If you've got electron withdrawing groups, things that suck electron density away from a local part of the molecule, it tends to move your signals over to the left. And then there are uh, parts of molecules that, because of the arrangement of the electrons, generate their own magnetic field. Uh, these porphyrins um, can generate huge magnetic fields, um, and um, they, that affects where the signals come as well. So uh, a couple of examples. Um, this is, um, oh, what's this one called? It's ethyl formate. So there's a hydrogen. It's all alone. It's sitting on a carbon that's got two oxygens. Oxygens uh, suck electron density away, so this guy is way far out. 
This guy is next to that oxygen, so he's sitting there. This guy, this methyl group, is sitting over here because he's further away from the oxygen. Um, this is actual data from our old spectrometer. I think we could have done something better to record the data because this guy came out to be 0.87 if this was defined as 2, and that one was almost exactly 3. Last guy is the standard. It's silicon with four methyl groups. Um, and a quick zoom on the splitting patterns. Um, this uh, peak, little blow up there, you can see that there's four peaks. There's a pattern, and that pattern tells us it's next has to be next to a CH3. This pattern here on the other side tells us it has to be next to a CH3. And so we have self-consistent data. Um, this is one of the ways that my students can uh, come back at me when I say, well, how do you know that you've made the right thing, right? The conversation always evolves from, I follow the directions and it's right from the right color, to, look, look at the graph here. Uh, it's beautiful. It's got all the right peaks. I can explain everything about this. You don't have a leg to stand on, Shaw. Ah, uh, you're ready to graduate. Okay, I'm not going to kind of get into that. Um, splitting happens and it follows rules, but I don't need to go into the rules. Um, and really quickly, what do we do with these compounds? Uh, there are things called electroanalytical methods. I've spent 30 years studying them and I learn new things all the time. Um, so our data looks like ducks. Uh, this graph. The line here basically represents what happens when you take an electrode, put in a solution, and you um, change the voltage on it in a linear way at some rate, and then um, change it back to where you started from. So y-axis is current, x-axis is potential. For the most well-behaved molecules that are stable, if you take an electron and give it to them or take one away, they're stable in both states, you get ducks. Yeah, they're called ducks. They look like ducks, right? They got their little feet there, they look like ducks. Um, sometimes if the chemistry is more interesting and there are real consequences to electron transfer, these ducks look like they've been hit by a truck. All right, so how do we find our ducks? Well. Okay, here's a picture of my dry box again. Uh, we've got an airlock on one side of the dry box. It's connected to a pump. Uh, so we can um, uh, put things in the airlock. We can pump all the air out. Then we can refill from the inside of the box. There's an argon tank that um, helps us keep the pressure up. We have flush that about three times. Then we can go into the box. And then we don't have any introduced oxygen or moisture in there. Inside the box, we can set up a little beaker with a tap and three electrodes in and things held together by electrical tape. Um, basically, there's only one electrode I care about. I have other electrodes in there because, well, you need at least two electrodes to pass electricity through someone or something. Um, and then there's a third electrode to tell the system what zero volts is uh, going to be. Um, oh. This bottle back here is uh, N-butyl lithium. I'm sorry, it's T-butyl lithium. Uh, it's perfectly safe in the dry box, but if you open it up, it's essentially self-igniting lighter fluid. Um, the dry box is a very handy place to have for dealing with things that are um, sensitive. This slide was from a conference. It's been a real busy month for me. I'm so sorry. Um, but this is the sort of data that we get. Um, this guy looks like our duck. It's the internal standard. It's supposed to be well behaved. Um, this is the uh, data. This is the peaks. These are the peaks for the compound that we had the NMR spectrum of. And essentially, um, you know, we start at some place where no current is flowing. We change the voltage. And we'll approach a voltage that's a threshold voltage for the molecule, at which it says, hey, OK, I'm going to take an electron from you, Mr. Electrode. Just don't hurry me. 
And depending on what rate of um, scan rate we use, we'll see slightly different data. There's another threshold where the molecule says, all right, all right, I'll take another electron. Just, just hold your horses, right? And um, then eventually we bring the scan back and the molecule says, all right, I'm done with this electron. Can I give it back to the electrode. Thank you. And then I'll, you can have that other electron back too. Now, the internal standard looks so pretty. These other things don't look pretty. And the reason is we have chemistry happening. And we can diagnose what chemistry is happening, um, but I don't want to uh, inflict that upon you after inflicting NMR on you. But essentially one take home message here, after reduction, this guy had a chloride on it. It swaps for the solvent. And we can tell that that swap happens as fast as it is physically possible for a swap to happen. And that is a rate that can be calculated um, um, with, um, what is it called? I'm going to get this wrong. I think it's the Bose-Einstein equation. No, it's not Bose. It's someone Einstein equation. So. Yeah, it, these these things, there, there, there's some definite kinetics kinetics here. So we collect the data. Uh, this is the same data, but shown as a uh, mathematical transform. I have my students do math on, on the data. And because the, the ducts are nice, but when you have peaks that go up and then go back down to the baseline, it's somewhat more satisfying. Oh my god, Stokes-Einstein equation, you are absolutely correct. That it, you can calculate how fast um, the diffusion rate is with Stokes um, Einstein. Um, uh, this is this is um, this particular slide is showing us um, data that has uh, convoluted with time, and then the derivative has been taken to show a different of the spectrum. Spectrum. Um, not to go into any detail. We can simulate these things. Um, so on the right, I've got some simulations of what's going on. On the left, that's the experimental data. It's a good fit, but the, I don't like, I haven't published this yet, because I don't like how the second reduction is going. Um, the second reduction in the experimental moves a lot more than what I've got the simulation. So I'm on the right track, but we're not there yet. Okay. And finally, we can combine our spectroscopy. Uh, that's that's a um, spectro ECAM cell that we use. We can combine, combine our spectroscopy and electrochemistry. Um, this was a $50,000 instrument. It was represented my first NSF grant, and uh, I've had it since 2002. It's in great working order. It's the thing that gets my students um, their data. And essentially, we have an electrode, and the, when we apply juice to the electrode, like electricity to the electrode, we'll make some chemical changes happen in the vicinity of the electrode. On the other side of things, we have a uh, fiber opt set of fiber optics that brings um, an infrared beam to the electrode. Hey, the electrode is made of platinum, and it's a polished disc. It's a great mirror. The, the um, IR beam just goes through the solution, bounces off the mirror, and then goes back into the fiber optics, where it's taken to a detector. And so essentially, we can take we can get infrared spectral data on um, our on the changes that happen in our compounds. Okay, and I'm going to show you some some data here. This is from my student Tony. Tony is now studying in uh, for his uh, uh, PhD level in uh, Germany. Um, he he left uh, got a master's with me last year. Um, and essentially, uh, innovation there, we're using a deuterated solvent so we can see the region between 1600 and 1200. That's kind of the first region that, or first time we've been able to see what's going on in there. Um, 
peaks pointing down are starting material that have been consumed. It's a different spectrum. We're basically looking at only the changes. Peaks pointing up are new uh, products. Infrared tells you about vibration. We're basically looking at how the vibrations of the molecule change. And from that, we can infer what structural changes have happened. So let's see. We are... We are, I'm not going to get, get too into that particular one. I've got another one I wanted to show you. Um, one of the things we want to do is um, give our compounds that have NO attached to them, we want to give them an electron or two, and then we want to give them a hydrogen. Here's the thing. Um, we want to make HNO attached to metals. One thing HNO attached to metals does is turns into water in N2O, which brings us back to our point of why we're doing this research in uh, the first place. Okay, so the green line in this voltammogram, as it's called, is showing us what happens to our molecule in the absence of some added acid. And then we added this very weak acid. It's called, uh, it's, uh, uh, para trifluoromethylphenol. Saying the real names of some of these compounds is more of a stunt than anything else. That we usually just call it that stuff. The red line is when you've added the H plus. And the major change is in what we call the reversibility of this second reduction. So after it's had two electrons and then a proton, it's like, hey, I'm a different compound now. You're not getting anything back. That's interesting to us. So we followed that up with the uh, spectroelectrochemistry. And there's a lot going on here, but uh, we determined that there's a good chance in this region, the 1379 peak, uh, there's a good chance that we have made the coordinated HNO. Um, it needs to be checked by uh, due duration. If we use a DNO uh, there, the peak will move in a predictable way. Uh, I'm not, myoglobin HNO has been structurally verified at uh, 1385 um, on this x-axis. Um, and we're, we're very close to that. So it, I think we're, I think, I think we've got it, uh, but we do need to do some checking. Okay, so where are we now? Here's some conclusions. Hey, we've done a lot of techniques. Um, we make, we make stuff. We try to figure out what we have, right? We try to prove to the skeptical, i.e., science, um, what what we have, and then we try to see what it does. Okay, and we want to see what the consequences of electron transfer are on these uh, compounds in the context of NO turning to O. This is all paying it forward. Um, in my group, I have had a lot of undergraduates uh, working with me. Um, I think I'm about at 50 so far. I've had uh, maybe 20, 25 master's uh, students. Um, the results that they get are uh, things that go into uh, papers that support funding uh, initiatives. And once we have funding, we can um, uh, give opportunities to um, future generations of students um, to keep this cycle going. Um, I don't like to think of it as a pyramid scheme. It is uh, basically what you do uh, to uh, provide opportunities like the ones I had when I was a student um, to uh, learn hands-on science. Um, how do I find my problems to solve? That's a good question. Uh, basically, uh, basically, we've been uh, working on uh, in this area of nitric oxide chemistry for some decades now. Uh, and, uh, you know, basically there are gaps in the knowledge um, so a good knowledge of the literature, good knowledge of what other people are doing, and uh, being able to recognize where, where there's a gap in knowledge that um, is impeding our progress. 
uh, that is that that's essentially where we find our uh, the problems. I mean, the chemistry is essentially infinite. Uh, there's uh, a lot of different types of atoms; they can combine in near infinite uh, ways. Uh, but you know, if you want to be able to do useful gap in the knowledge problem that uh, will affect people, right? So uh, greenhouse gas problem of immediate concern. In fact, um, in the body, how NO might be um, nitrogen can um, molecules that are important for us. That's also um, that's also an area to start with. So let's see what else I have. I, it's more like pictures now. Uh, there's my acknowledgement uh, slide one of that. So that's where I get my X-ray data from. There's uh, open databases. Uh, JMOL, Blender, and Unity um, help with uh, making meshes to upload to Second Life. Um, there's some more cats. Uh, so you can see uh, Seth here and Ishtar and Marty. And I would like to thank them specifically for not jumping on the keyboard today, even though they're circling around my feet. Uh, I want to acknowledge you guys. Um, Science Circle is a wonderful organization. Uh, Chantal and Jess um, especially put a lot of work into it. Um, and, you know, you guys coming out on your Saturday for um, uh, to listen to me rant about my uh, research um, is very uh, humbling. NSF, of course, my research students, George, my buddy George, all the uh, folks at uh, the school, and definitely you again. Do I have any more? Let me see if I have any more. I might have some pictures. Oh, here's some more pictures. The Missouri Botanical Garden over in St. Louis is a delightful place to go. Um, um, water lilies, um, outdoor pools, um, sculpture exhibitions, uh, and indoors um, in the winter, there's orchid shows, roses. There's, there's me from before I had gray hair. Um, and finally, finally, tanks again. <laughs> tanks, tanks. And then um, um, Finn looks a lot happier now that the talk is over. And there's the porphyrin cookie. It was about uh, two feet wide, and it's flat and purple, just like a porphyrin cup. All right, so there, that's, uh, that's what I have planned for you today. Um, so I'm happy to talk to you about any questions you might have. Looks like a pie. It was a big cookie. Yeah, my student, Kenny, um, his girlfriend made that for him and brought it um, at his uh, first seminar. Our students have to do, our grad students have to do two public seminars as part of their master's program. It was yummy. Oh yeah, man, you should see, I, I, I have, um, I have uh, pottery. You know, there's places where you can go and buy a finished but unfired piece of pottery and you can paint it. I have no artistic talent, so I just put like molecular orbital diagrams and structures on them and paint them up. I've got a whole bunch of this stuff in my office. It, it actually looks like art. All righty. Well, if we're um, if we are um, done with questions, uh, then um, I'm going to sign off the voice, and then um, then uh, maybe hang out for a couple more minutes and uh, do stuff by text. And thank you all again.